Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for once again allowing us together in this place. Yes, yes. On this corner to give you praise, to give you glory, to give you honor. We thank you, Lord, for all of your many, many blessings. Thank you for healing. Thank you for providing. Thank you for protecting. Thank you for being patient with us. Lord, there are many here this morning who are going through life's journey sometimes good sometimes difficult sometimes challenging sometimes new things come our way that we've never experienced before what we are believing and trusting lord that you're able to guide us through it because lord you've already been there yeah, yeah. father we ask for strength we ask for understanding of your word we ask for discipline in study we ask heavenly father that you give us peace in the midst of this life's journey lord we pray for you to continue to heal those who are in sickness we ask for you to move in families lord we ask you to move heavenly father in the life of those who serve and worship here and draw us nearer and closer to you lord forgive us of the sins that we have committed the wrong that we have done the hurt that we've given to others forgive us lord for letting you down again now, Lord, we pray that what we have here prepared is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We pray, Lord, that someone might be strengthened, someone might be encouraged, someone might be drawn closer to you. That you would receive the honor, that you would receive the praise and the glory and the honor. Yes, Lord. And that you would draw all men unto you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture text for the morning will come from 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. from the King James Version. Second Peter, chapter three, verse 18. Mm -hmm. But grow in grace yes. and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever, amen. amen. Advancing in knowledge and holiness. Amen. Reading from our church covenant, the second paragraph, it says, we engage therefore by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. This is the first place in the covenant that mentions the word church and the only place where it states the Christian's obligation to the church. The only other time the word church is used is at the very end where it talks about our obligation to join another church if we leave 
the present one where we worship. What is church? Is it a building? It is, is it a denomination? Is it an organized body governed by constitution and bylaws? Is it the clergy? Is it the people? If you look up the word church, you will find that church is a noun, an adjective, and a verb. We talk about the building of the body of believers as a church. We use the word to describe church architecture or church music, but church is also used as a verb. It is used to describe the process of bringing a person into the church. In evangelism, they talk about the church and the unchurched people. This section of the covenant we are going to look at explores three verbs that describe three actions of the church. Advancing in knowledge and holiness. What are the three verbs? Strive, promote, and sustain. The first is strive. The covenant says we engage to strive for the advancement of the church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort. The word strive means to try hard, to work hard, to struggle, to fight. Striving implies a sustained effort to push beyond former boundaries. In the covenant, the object of our striving is the advancement of the church in knowledge and holiness. In 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7, Paul communicates this idea by using three metaphors. One is being a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament times, such a pledge was fitting response to the direct command to believers found at the end of the second epistle of Peter. They, like we, face the ever-present threat of becoming too comfortable, complacent, are slack as we wait on the promised return of God. He's coming back. He's coming back for his believers and his saints. He's coming back for those who have submitted to his will. He's coming back again for those who have decided to follow Jesus. As Christians, a Christian does not simply sign up and then sit in a pew. We should strive, try hard, fight the battles and the struggles that we face. There is an effort to church life. There is an effort to the Christian life. The church is to be advancing. What does advancing look like to you? What, how are we to be advancing here on this corner? What is it going to look like when we, Truvine Baptist Church, is advancing 
and doing what God would have of us to do. The hymn, thank you, Brother Johnson, onward Christian soldiers reads like a mighty armor moves the church of God. We should be a mighty armor moving and doing what God has directed of us to do. When we're part of a church, we're part of an army which is advancing. It says we are to strive for the advancement of the church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort. Peter closed his epistle by encouraging believers to grow in grace, the unmerited favor of God, the gift of salvation. This suggests that the knowledge for which we strive is not knowledge in general. Some of us have a lot of knowledge about the Bible, but we don't put it into practice. Daddy Blue, you know him, you've heard about Daddy Blue. He knew to come by the church every now and then and drop off a little piece of offering to the church. Why did he come by doing that? I never found out, but he on regular basis would come by from CUNY Homes projects, come by the church, sit in the back and offer a little piece of offering to the church. The purpose of gaining knowledge is not for the sake of debate or bragging because we have obtained some knowledge. Rather, it's the kind of knowledge that forms us into what God called us to be. This growth in grace comes through knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He tells us that we ought to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our spirit. That's what we talked about last week. And we ought to let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us with that love that we love one another in the same manner that he loved the church. How much did he love the church? He died for you and for me. He went to Calvary for you and for me. He was willing to submit himself to the body of flesh so that he could allow for you and me to become a part of his family, his adopted sisters and brothers. Mm. Of all the ways a church can grow, to grow in knowledge and holiness stands first in line. We may grow numerically. It would be good to see the seats more filled up. But it matters little if the church is not growing in the knowledge of God. Not growing in the understanding of grace. Not growing and understanding the holiness that we should be partaking of. Knowledge of God, understanding grace and its holiness. First and foremost, we must strive for greater knowledge of God. We need to know the story of God's gracious dealing with his chosen people through whom the families of the earth are to be blessed. We grow in knowledge through intimate personal communion with God. And knowledge of God comes also through understanding scripture's testimony to the faithful God. We learn about God's grace and the knowledge of Christ in the Bible. The Bible is God's mind concerning everything we need to know to live the Christian life. We have a purpose for studying the Bible. We need to know how to love one another. Amen. All of us are not lovable, but we can be loved. All of us are not 
we we not gonna be buddy buddy hanging out all the time, but we ought to be able to love one another. If somebody does us a wrong, we ought to be able to show them love by being merciful to them, just like Christ is merciful to us. If they stab you in the back, you ought to be able to show mercy. If they do you wrong, you ought to be able to show them mercy. Some people read the Bible to find fault in the Bible. Others read it to find support for their agendas, their opinions, and the way they want things to be done. Some read bits and pieces of the Bible to validate and feel comfortable about themselves. Others read the Bible out of religious duty with little sincere interest in the outcome that the Bible can bring about. Our purpose is that we might grow spiritually. Personal spiritual growth is a noble reason for Bible study. It seeks to fulfill God's commands found in our text. The psalmist prayed, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. He believed that the Bible could guide his steps and keep him from sin. Among the final words penned by the Apostle Paul before his martyrdom are these. Study to show yourself approved unto God a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We must diligently study the Bible to receive God's approval so that we can rightly interpret what it says. We might have to buy an extra book or two in order to gain understanding of what God is directing of us to do in the Bible. We might have to get one of those Bible study documents that show us how to interpret and understand the Bible. That's not just for me, that's for you too. So that you can rightly understand what God's word is saying. So that I will not trip you up by telling you one thing and the Bible is saying another. You need to get it for yourself. So that you can be sure that what I'm talking about up here is found in God's word. And if it's not, you need to sit me down. Amen. Light. The first verb is strive. The second verb used in this section is to promote the church. In the covenant, we're engaging to promote the prosperity and the spirituality of the church. The purpose of striving is not to keep busy in religious activities. We're to get somewhere to advance and to promote. Last week we talked about if we love God, there ought to be some evidence that we love God. Um, Brother Johnson, I don't want to remember that from last week. There are folk out there ought to be astounded and amazed at how wonderful we get along up in here, even though we sometimes disagree. We are not so disagreeable that we can't work this thing out. Amen. We ought not fall out and get a divorce because you can't have your way. We ought not fall out and I get kicked to the curb without a chance to get it together and get it right. Are y'all there? Amen. We're trying to advance and promote our church by our actions, by the things that we do. 
it ought to promote the church. But there are things that have gone on in church who tur that turn my children off from wanting to be at church. Amen. Tell the truth. That there are things that have happened in church that people walked out the door and never came back because of something we did, said, or how we acted about something. In Hebrews, the writer says, by this time, all of us up in here that's been here since, I, I mean, uh, 1966, I joined this church, and many of you were here then, and many of you came after then. But since we've been here some years, we've been here some decades, we've been here for a while. And Hebrews tells us by this time we ought to be teachers instead of you needing someone to teach you. Again, the elementary principles of the scriptures of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food. He accuses them of continuing to be spiritual babies when they should have long time ago grown up some been promoted to a higher grade. We, we don't want these babies over here staying in the fifth grade, sixth grade, fourth grade, twelve. We want them to move up. Yes. But in order for you to move up, grow, get better, you got to do some stuff to do that. This is true of individuals and it's also true of the church. We're supposed to be together in this. A church does not progress unless members progress. It's like the coach who tells the players, we ain't moving until we get this play right. If we don't get this play right, we're going to stay right here till the lights come on. Somebody ain't heard that before. We're here to promote this church's prosperity and spirituality. We're to move this church ahead we're to move this church ahead in the things that we do prosperity is more than money although it does include that but we are to prosper as a church in every way it might be beneficial for some of us to go by OETBA teaching on Monday. Amen. It, it might be beneficial for us to find free Bible study lessons online and sit down and turn uh, the football game, the basketball, the baseball off and s do some of that instead of... We might, we might have to block out some time for study and scripture reading and prayer and meditation so that we can grow spiritually as believers. The first verb is strive, the second verb is promote, and the third verb is to sustain. As members, together we are to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. This is a sustained growth and prosperity, not haphazard, not hit and miss, not air now and then. As Christians, we are to sustain our spiritual condition through spiritual exercise. I've been going since May on a regular basis to exercise. Amen. Lifting weights, walking, doing the elliptical since May. I feel so much better. I am much stronger. But during, after school started, there was a week I went one day. Another week I couldn't go at all. And when I went back in, I was not feeling the same. Because I missed consistently working out. Over the past two weeks, three weeks, I've been every day but Saturday and Sunday. And I feel myself getting better. I feel myself feeling better. When we come here 
for our spiritual exercise, we ought to be growing stronger, feeling better, handling life's journey a little bit better. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy in his first letter, exercise yourself toward godliness for the bodily exercise profits a little but godliness is profitable for all things having the promise of life that it now is and of that which is to come. A church is a spiritual gymnasium used to exercise us toward godliness. How do we do it? The apostle mentions four exercises that we can participate in. First is worship. You ought to be able to praise the Lord in the midst of trials and tribulation. When you're on the mountaintop and you got plenty of money and everything is going good, you can praise the Lord. When everything is going your way, the children are acting right, the wife is acting right, the money is good, the house is good, everything is good. We can praise him. But when life sends us challenges, we have difficulty in praising him. It says ordinances. There are some ordinances that we participate in. The two ordained ordinances that we have are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is an entry ritual into the church. It's acknowledging that Lord, I've been saved. And I want to show them that I've been saved. So I come to be baptized. The baptism is not going to save us. The water can't do it. Only the Lord intervening in our life can do it. The Lord's Supper is the sustaining ordinance. We are sustained by the spiritual sustenance we receive at the table. It's an emblem. It's an, a picture. It's not... Then there is discipline. This has to do with ethical standards. Then there is doctrine. Matters, especially the articles of faith that we handed out to you. Those are the doctrines that we follow and believe. The scripture, the true God, the fall of man, the way of salvation, justification. Mm, keep going. He tells us in 2 Peter 3 and 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Before the great apostle says this final amen, he reminds his readers about growth, grace, and knowledge. Growth is a commandment for the Christian follower. It's not an option. The Greek word insinuates be constantly growing. Never stop growing as a Christian. We ain't never going to arrive at what he wants us to be, but we got to keep striving, keep working, keep digging, keep trying to get better. If you haven't conquered anger yet, you got some work to do. If it's jealousy or bitterness or laziness or gossiping, you still got some work to do. Every one of us has some room for improvement. This admonition to grow is the culmination of a long discourse that Peter went through about the danger of false teaching. So we see growth is essential to overcome the stuff that we got to deal with. We've got to keep growing. And this kind of growth takes effort. The great apostle knew about growth. Peter knew about growth. Peter, you know Peter. He was the one who was the first one to speak. He was the one who was the first one to jump out on the water. He was the one who said, Lord, you know, I'll never deny you. I'll be with you always. And he was the first one. Wasn't he the one? He knew about grace. He, he was the first one to get in deep trouble. Having felt the sting of guilt, Peter is the first one that gives us the understanding of the work we've got to do 
And it also shows us it's not impossible. If he denied him three times, if he turned his back on him and he said, go find the disciples and Peter. Grace. God's favor on undeserving men. We're saved by grace, not by our own merit. But it does not cease to operate in our lives after conversion. Grace is needed for strength. Grace is needed for us to endure suffering. There is no place on earth where we can find what God has in store for us. There is no place on earth that we can find what God has in store for the Christian believer. What does he have in store for us? Jesus said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. A place not made by the hands of man. I'm going away to a place where the wicked shall cease from troubling. I'm going away to a place where there will be no more weeping, no more crying, no more dying, no more suffering, no more aches and pains. I'm going away to a place that he's going to build my mansion that's not made by the hands of man. He's going away to a place where there will be no more tears no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, and no more pain. Yes. And many of us are acting like we got it all sold up. I've been on the battlefield for a long time, and I know that my place is reserved for me in heaven. I hope you're not the one that he comes up to and tells you, I, I never knew you. I hope you're not the one he comes up to and tells you that you didn't do the things that I ask of you to do. I hope that you will be one of those who he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. My God. Advancing in knowledge and holiness. Yes. Striving, promoting, and doing the Lord's will. That's what we are striving to do here on this corner. That the Lord would be pleased with the works that we are doing. There may be one here this morning in the midst of a time in your life where you're unsure of your relationship with the Lord. There may be one here who has backslidden and fallen by the wayside. There may be one here this morning who, in the midst of life's struggle, and you're challenged by the difficulties and the challenges that you're facing. Many of us here this morning can testify to the fact that the Lord will come see about you. The Lord will deliver you in the midst of your trials and your tribulations. The Lord will be a doctor in the hospital room. The Lord will be a lawyer in the courtroom. Yes. The Lord will wake you up every morning, mm -hmm. touch you with his finger of love, and give you a second chance to get life together. You may have faced some things that you've never seen or faced before, but know that our God, the one that we serve, the one that we read about in our Bible, is able to handle any situation and any circumstance. We just ask you to try him, trust him, and allow for him to handle your life's journey. 
and he will deliver right on time. You have to acknowledge that you need him. You have to believe that he can save you, and you have to confess that you're a sinner in need of God's grace. And if you do those things, he's promised to deliver every promise that we see in our Bible. We've done as the Lord has commanded. There will always be room in our Father's kingdom. This time we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings.